Then go ahead, Mr. Lode. Jennifer, please, the court, I, I would like to reserve five minutes. That's um, fine. Uh, my, I'm Mark Ludwig. I had the privilege of representing Mr. Knight uh, by appointment of this court um, uh, in this reopened appeal. I would like to begin, I, I don't want to browbeat the facts, but I, I would like to begin by reminding the court that the state and I ha have had very few agreements, but we have this agreement that the facts are accurately set forth in this court's uh, first opinion in point of fact at paragraph six, this court said that it was undisputed that the dirt bike's engine revved, Keith maneuvered away from Curtis, then turned or was turned by virtue of a collision back towards Curtis, Mr. Knight, and Michelle. That is towards the dead end side of the street. The dirt bike then did a wheelie at which point Mr. Knight fired a second shot. Those described facts are, are agreed to, and I think are significant now in this re-argued, uh, reopened appeal. The first assignment of error, of course, is the error in the defense of property instruction. Uh, if the court would like to review the transcript where that all takes place, that's the transcript at 18.3 through 18.59. I think it's important to read that transcript in the sense that what it reveals is the state never formally requested this charge. The state apparently had uh, communicated with or without proof of service is unknown, communicated with the trial court's judicial attorney and suggested a uh, 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 retaking of property instruction. It's described on those pages. One of the things the state says to us is that uh, Mr. Gill's uh, mission and his sole purpose was to recover property. Uh, there's no pinpoint citation provided for that. In point of fact, I believe Mr. Gill's testimony was he went first to determine whether the bike was the bike that was his, and then, if it was, to see if he could get it back. The state also said Knight's, Mr. Knight's sole purpose, the state's words, not mine, Mr. Knight's sole purpose was to, quote, cart the bike away. Well, wait a minute, if that's his sole purpose, he doesn't have the purpose to commit murder. Let's not confuse the words purpose. Look, giving this defense of property instruction was wrong under any standard of proof. The affirmative defense of a defendant, the affirmative defense of defense of property is not equal to, is not the same as, you can't use deadly force to recover property. Defendant never requested a defense of property instruction and resent any such instruction. The state requested not a defense of property instruction. Again, it's in the transcript. The ineffective assistance of trial counsel, uh, the second assigned error. Look, the difference here is the failure to preserve an objection made versus the failure to make a tactical objection. Now, failing to make an objection can be tactical. Failing to preserve the, inject, the, the objection means counsel has already made the tactical decision that the objection should be made and then has not protected his own or her own tactical decision. There is a difference between failure to preserve, which this court pointed out in the first case, versus failure to make. Most of the state's case law is, well, gee, the failure to make an objection is tactical. No, the tactics was already decided by the trial counsel. They set the standard that, per, that needed to preserve the objection. Strickland applies to beyond just trial results. 
uh, I think it's Padilla, you pronounce it, versus Kentucky. Strickland applies whenever it can have, when counsel's mistakes, missteps, can have direct or collateral consequences. What's the misstep here? Trial counsel created a trial box, if you will. I tell this to clients all the time. An appeal is a box of things we bring to you and say, look in it, and things are wrong. And clients keep wanting to go outside the box. And you keep saying, no, it's not in the record. Trial counsel here created a trial box without the essential tool in it of a preserved objection to a prejudicial instruction. Counsel, let me that stop. Hamstrings. Counsel. Counsel, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to stop you. I'm sorry for interrupting, but uh, I, I was a little confused because <clears throat> my understanding is that trial court really didn't give the instruction that uh, the state wanted. It oh, really it didn't. Okay. So yeah, it, it, go ahead. Just explain that to no, me. No, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I, I, trial, the, the trial court pulled it out of uh, its research. And the trial court also said um, that um, I'm not giving your instruction you requested because I think it's covered by this defense of property instruction. And I think that's, that's covered in the transcript at those pages I referenced that uh, I don't need to give yours, I'm giving this one. Yours may be uh, wrong, mine's right. But again, it's, it's, a, it's a defense requested instruction and it's wrong under any of the three standards. Pick one, abuse of discretion, plain error, simple error. Uh, it's wrong under any of the de novo. It's wrong under any one of the ones. We're not here to debate which standard needs to be applied. But on the, on the trial counsel not objecting, he hands this trial box to appellate counsel without the preserved objection which first hamstrings appellate counsel right there. And then as we see in the, this court's decision, the, um, trial counsel, appellate counsel starts to run the race with a bad hamstring and trips and doesn't argue error. So we've got, it's, it's the combination of the two. The manifest weight argument, I am so tired after 45 years of listening to the, this court accept the responsibility that it is sitting as the 13th juror and then listening to it be told, don't substitute your judgment for the other jurors. Wait a minute, every day in every trial you conducted, you told jurors, don't give up your honest beliefs because you differ from what other jurors think. This, this case must be decided by yourself. This trinity must decide by itself as a 13th juror based on this record. And what makes this record different than the prior appeal is exactly the opening statement of facts that this court has already found and is unchallenged. It is undisputed that the bike rev maneuvered away from them, then turned and headed back toward them. It makes no difference whether the decedent intended to run them over or not. The difference is that it, the perception of a bike popping a wheelie and coming at you, okay, that's the, that's the reason that you self-defend. You're not trying to recover a bike. One generally doesn't recover property by shooting at it. Um, so the, 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 the broader arguments that are counsel, before you get to the, wants me to. Counsel, before you get to the broader argument, you were at your um, reserve time. If you want to continue, you can, but you only have five minutes left altogether. Well, just quickly, the ineffective assistance of appellate counsel is... Um, we keep, we're being told that because we're arguing in appellate, ineffective assistance, uh, we're asking you must vacate, you must vacate it, you must get grant a new trial because of appellate assistance. No, no, no. Reopening an appeal is the first step of two in this court. 
The federal court's hamstrung. The federal court gets a habeas petition and decides whether or not uh, the argument had some plausible merit. This court decides the second part is this case, deciding the underlying claims that are argued to be uh, against the appeal. Um, finally, uh, you know, the retroactivity argument, which uh, is, I just want to be clear about one thing. The answer you always get to this is this is retroactive application. No, it's not. It's application of the present law at the present time. This case was presently decided. You apply the law today because this is a pending case today. We keep getting the, the uh, legislative, uh, the, the constitutional argument of uh, section 28, the General Assembly shall have no power to pass retroactive laws. That's what we hear. Well, we're not, we're not talking about a retroactive law. Same constitutional clause. Reading not just the first sentence, the General Assembly may, by general laws, authorize courts to carry into effect upon terms just and equitable the manifest intention of officers by curing errors in proceedings arise out of their want of conformity with the laws of this state. That's the retroactive clause read in pertinent parts, not just read as the first clause, it bars anything retroactive. So if it please the court, the easiest solution is in this case is to find the uh, error in, in the defense of property charge and to give us another trial. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you. Counsel for the Ms. Corgan. Hi. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, may it please the court, I'm Jacqueline Corgan on behalf of the state of Ohio. Um, just briefly, I'm going to go through some of the, the um, defendant's arguments. Concerning the jury instruction, which seems to be the defendant's key argument, um, standards of review are important. And when this court is looking at whether the trial court has, has stated the law correctly, when it has instructed a jury, that gets de novo review. The giving of an instruction is only reviewed on an abuse of discretion standard. That is, that is well settled law in this state. Overlaying that, though, is the standard of review that we, that we apply of plain error to cases where the, the error has not been preserved by trial counsel. Okay, and what that requires is not just a showing that the trial court abused its discretion in giving the, the instruction in question, but also that, it, that, it, that because of that instruction, the jury would reach a different result than it would have in the absence of that instruction. And in this case, granted, yes, this, the instruction that's at issue in this case was not requested by the state. This, what the state had requested was closer to the instruction that would be given in a case where you actually had a, a repossession of property that was, you know, for instance, it's secured property and the creditor is trying to reclaim the debtor's secured property or collateral after a default. That's, that was from um, Revised Code 1309-609, um, which we cited in, in the state's brief. What that does is it prohibits even a breach of the peace that when a person is trying to use self-help to, re to recover collateral. That would have been a, a step too far. And so the, the trial court correctly rejected that notion and instead gave what is correct law in, in Ohio, which is that a person is not permitted to use deadly force to recover property. That is a correct statement of the law. It's not misleading in this context. And remember, this was not the very first instruction that the court gave. This instruction appeared 
in the context of the court explaining to the jurors that it was going to be giving them the law um, and the instruction was given and then there was a mention of the the pamphlet and all the instructional materials that Mr. Knight had received from his concealed carry permit instructor and the court was inst instructed the jury that that was not to be considered by them to be the law and and that they were to rely on the trial court for a statement of the law so it, it was not as we laid out in the brief it was not in the context of this is part of of how I, we're going to instruct you as to the murder charge and as to self-defense in addition this instruction was not the linchpin of the state's case and even if this instruction had not been given there's there's no showing that the verdict would have been different that mr knight would have been acquitted because Counsel, were, oh, before sure. you go on to that issue i'd like to go back to the jury instructions and when i was reading your brief and then as i'm looking at it glancing at it again as we're talking this morning um it seems to me that it, the jury instruction the court gave was just the general defense of property, not really even dealing with recovery of property. It was a strange hybrid, Your Honor, and it was was closer to defense of property, but not exactly point by point. It was more of a, I, the way I would describe it is more of an amalgamation of the concept that the state wanted to get at, which was that Oh, and which was it actually came out was it that Ohio just does not permit a person to use deadly force you know, to recover property the idea was to fend off the the notion that a person could use deadly force in order to in, in this kind of situation where someone was trying to recover stolen property but it was not the linchpin of of Mr. Knight's case and it did not impinge upon his his claim of self-defense his self-defense claim as we argue further in the brief concerning manifest weight failed on its own merits irrespective of this jury instruction and as far as count trial counsel's alleged ineffectiveness for failing to object a second time to this particular jury instruction there 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 really is no case law to support the idea that a failure to make appellate, or appellate counsel's job easier by preserving an error so that it doesn't have to be argued on plain error, there, there's no real case law to support that that in itself is trial counsel ineffectiveness. Because remember, even if a trial counsel fails to preserve an error, it's not necessarily unreachable by this court. Does it make it more difficult for appellate counsel to argue? Certainly, because it adds, like I, like I said in describing uh, plain error, it adds another level or another layer of analysis that this court has to apply. So you wouldn't have to just find the error existed, but you have to find that the error actually affected the outcome of the trial. Again, does that make it more difficult for appellate counsel? Certainly. Um, would, would those of us who are appellate counsel, would we, per, would we prefer that that error be preserved properly? Yes. But in no way did Mr. Knight's counsel forfeit, or well, no, I take that back. He forfeited the error, but he did not waive it. A waiver is a complete relinquishment of a right, and that did not occur here. So it, this I mean, we're, we've talked now twice in this case about this very jury instruction. This is, that, this is still an issue that is reachable by this court. If there had been a waiver, it would not be. And that, I'm not going to, say, I'm not going to concede that that could be an ineffective assistance argument. But in this case, a forfeiture of an error does not constitute trial counsel ineffectiveness. Now, as to appellate counsel ineffectiveness, I would just remind the court that the very relief that Mr. Knight has asked for in this reopened appeal concerning ineffective assistance of appellate counsel is he's actually asked for a new trial based on appellate counsel's alleged ineffectiveness. 
There is no case law, nor is there any logical support for granting a person a new trial based solely on appellate counsel's alleged ineffectiveness. And in, in addition, Mr. Knight still has to show, in order to, to demonstrate ineffective assistance of appellate counsel or, or trial counsel, still has to show that the outcome would have been different. And in an appeal, he would have to show that the outcome of his original appeal would have been different if his previous appellate counsel had developed the plain error argument. And where there is no error, there can be no plain error, and there can also be no ineffective assistance. Let me stop you there because it, it does get a little, because like you said, there's so many layers here. <laughs> but what it comes down to is now that the case has been reopened and before us, we just need to look at this uh, jury instruction on defensive property and, and determine whether it was proper. And if it wasn't proper, um, was it prejudicial error? Would you yes. agree with that? I, I would, Your Honor. That is, that is the, the inner layer of the onion of this appeal. <laughs> okay. I mean, because we've been talking about layers, and, and so it, it's the inner layer of the onion. Mm -hmm. Re regarding, though, another point that Mr. Knight now makes in the reopened appeal concerning the retroactivity or the alleged retroactivity of 290105 and its shifting of the burden of proof from the defendant to prove uh, the affirmative defense to the state to disprove the affirmative defense. Um, 290105 is a statute and the the kind of retroactivity and, and I know that defense counsel doesn't like the term retroactivity in this context but we we apply rules of law created by courts concerning fundamental rights to cases that are currently pending before the court. For instance, the cases that out of the US Supreme Court in the last several years that have required search warrants to apply a GPS tracker to someone's vehicle or to get cell phone data. Those were court decisions that, that discussed people's constitutional rights. Those do get applied to cases that are currently pending on appeal. Statutes, however, and changes to statutes do not. And that is why Ohio's Constitution in Article 2, Section 28, and the, statu the general statutes that apply it base are, are very clear. If a statute does not expressly say that it applies to situations that occurred prior to its enactment or to its amendment, then it, does, then it operates prospectively only. And even the, the Gloff case that, that counsel filed around four o'clock, five o'clock last night to supplement the, the arguments here today, that case does not support defendant's argument that 290105 ought to apply two years after defendant's trial occurred and was concluded. Um, Gloff applied to a case that was being tried at the time when the amendment to the statute was going into effect in March of 2019. And the court in that case said, yes, the burden should shift to that, to the, the state in that case because trial was going on at the time and under the plain language, language of 290105, it, it should apply to that trial. However, the defendant's trial in this case concluded almost a full year prior to the amendment of 290105. So it it you you do not apply that a statute to a case that's already been tried and is only on appeal. You do when it's a court decision concerning a constitutional right that existed you know, all along. And as far as the manifest way of the evidence, um, 
I would remind the court that even though the defendant has brought a manifest weight argument as a as one assignment of error and has also attempted to bring a sufficiency assignment of error, the way defendant had originally argued the sufficiency assignment of error in the brief um, sounded as a manifest weight argument. Um, there has since, by the way, been case law that has come out and I would refer the court to State versus Jones out of the first district. The citation is 2020 Ohio 281. And out of the fifth district, State versus McBride, 2020 Ohio 559, that clarifies that because self defense and other affirmative defenses, like, like self defense and defense of others, are justifications for admitted conduct that sufficiency of the evidence is not a proper assignment of error to bring. It's not the analysis that this court or any other court should engage in. And how that impacts this case is, for instance, defendant is, is still arguing that, that he did not have the requisite mens rea to commit a murder in this case. Well, because self-defense is a justification for admitted conduct, that challenge to that element, the mens rea cannot be argued in that. He, in order to take a self-defense defense, he had to have admitted yes, you know, to every other element of murder, including mens rea. So I would just point, I apologize for the cuckoo, Your Honor. <laughs> it, it could be worse, there's a cat behind me too. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, um, that, um, so um, I did want, want to point that out to, to the court and I understand I, I understand I am probably running out of my time and unless about 30 there, seconds left. <laughs> then the state would would respectfully thank the court, ask you to um, review the case on the briefs and our arguments and to affirm this conviction. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Mr. Ludwig, you have three minutes remaining. Your Honor, if it please the court. Um, there's a number of cases cited in my opponent's argument that uh, I don't believe are cited in briefs or were given any advance notice at all. And I apologize for the late timing of Gloff, but it actually was decided June 1st and um, as, as I delayed reading it, I guess, for three or four days, uh, I reported it when I first read it. But talking about uh, recent 2020 cases that I've never seen, I, I do object to, and I, I, I don't think this case ought to be decided based on those, or at least I, I ought to be provided the citations and a chance to talk. Council, Counter, would Gloff talk? Council, I don't want to waste your time, but uh, yes, um, you, uh, you do have to file a supplemental authority. And, um, you know, again, uh, I wasn't going to waste everybody's time. And we will consider what's in the briefs, and that's it, you know, unless it is supplemental authority. Thank okay. you. Now yeah, you go ahead. Uh, yeah, and again, it's not just an argument over the word retroactivity. Look, when is a case pending? The statute applies to a pending case. The prosecution wants you to say you don't count. A case is not pending when it's here. Ohio grants a right of appeal. A case in a felony case is not over until the appellate time is blown, and that probably includes filing a motion for a delayed appeal, but it's not over until this court speaks. When this case was first argued, when it's being argued today, the, the law is that self-defense, if it exists in the record, must be proved by the state. This is not a statutory issue, a constitutional issue. That statute changed the burden of proof. The burden of proof, not persuasion, not going forward, the burden of proof of self-defense 
as we sit here on this record must be done by the state beyond reasonable doubt. Is it a horrible, troublesome, difficult thing to do? You're reviewing under a different standard the trial court didn't have. I'm sorry, the Constitution requires it. It's a pending case. And that is that is this a narrow class of cases? Yeah, it's a fairly narrow class of cases. Every self-defense case that came up after March 28th of 19, everybody's going to agree, well, the new statute applies. The new statute applies in this court when this court decides things. Well, counsel, the only, That's when counsel, it applies. The only problem with that is when you're talking about constitutional, constitutionality and constitutional rights, <clears throat> at that point, the state wasn't even aware that it had to have the burden of proof on that. So that's not really well, fair either, is it? Fair to the state? No, I, I don't believe the constitutional rights and protections were created to be fair to the it's state. It's supposed to be fair to both I parties. I think the state... No, I don't think they were created okay. to be fair to both parties, Your Honor. I think our Constitution protects individual rights first and foremost. And that's the, that's, the, that's the court I want to practice in. That's the country I want to live in. Okay, well, you're out of time. Thank you, Your Honor. <laughs> Thank you very much for your presentations. Thank you, both of you. We will do it the way we always do, and that is we will take the matter under advisement and we'll um, uh, send out a written opinion when we, uh, when we issue it, and it'll be sent to both parties and also released on the website. So thank you very much and everybody stay safe. Thank you.